so I'm going to invite you to be in a spirit of prayer with me. We're going to pray before we get into the scriptures. God, take these utterances and make of them a gift to the hearts and minds of your people. Where I am in the way, silence me. Where I am following your way, magnify my voice. Be with us in our hearing and guide us in our doings. This we ask in the way of Christ. Amen. Our scripture comes from uh, John 20, verses 19 through 31. And it's Jesus appearing to the disciples. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After, or after he said this, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As God has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed of those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. And this last portion is called the purpose of this book. Listen clearly, please. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Amen. Happy, happy nigger day. That's what her shirt said. This was January 16th, 1995 in Moss Point, Mississippi. I was working in the paint supply section of a local hardware store. As I stood facing her for what felt like an eternity, I waited for her to speak before I said anything. With a smirk on her face that looked as if she was in on a secret that I had no clue about, she said to me, I need you to mix me some cans of paint. What colors, I asked, intent on engaging her as little as possible. The darkest tar black you can make and the brightest pure white you can make was her sneering reply as she giggled with her friend who was there to cheer her on. This wasn't the first time I had encountered an overt racist. I'd experienced that many times between childhood and this day. This was, however, the first time as an adult that I had someone come up to me at my job and try to test me like that. Here I was, the only token black employee out of 81 employees working at this hardware store, and I had to have this lady as my customer. I 
can't begin to tell you how many different scenarios played out in my head about how to respond to this person who was clearly trying to get to me. But I knew there was only one that was consistent with the man God had called me to be, so I silently prayed for strength to be that man in that moment. Uh, As they giggled behind my back, I grabbed the basis for the paint mixture and prepared to fulfill her request. As I did so, I wrestled with thoughts of how what this person was trying to do to me was nothing compared to what so many of my ancestors had been through. And yet, there was something in me that wanted to snap on her. What gave, what gave her the right to think that she could just decide to come to my job and potentially destroy my life? And make no mistake, the potential was there. I knew enough to know that if I responded to her in a certain way, it was very likely that the police would have gotten involved and I would more than likely be on the losing end of that scenario. And that wasn't going to happen that day. Maybe the day before, maybe the day after, but not that day because that day was Martin Luther King Jr. Day, what she was calling nigger day. And I knew that I owed him too much to react to this person in the way that she probably expected and wanted me to. But by God's grace and the connection to my forebears, I decided that I would give her the opportunity to see her behavior in the mirror of consciousness by doing what some call an incentive reversal. And if you don't know uh, what an incentive reversal is, perhaps this example from comedian and activist Dick Gregory, who was a master of incentive reversal, will uh, enlighten you. Here's an example um, from a story that he used to share. Last time I was down south, I walked into this restaurant and this white waitress came up to me and said, We don't serve colored people here. I said, that's all right. I don't eat colored people. Bring me a whole fried chicken. (laughs) Thank God for people like Dick Greg. (laughs) About then, these three cousins come in. You know the ones I mean. Clue, Clux, and Clan. And they say, boy, we're giving you fair warning. Anything you do to that chicken, we're going to do to you. So I put down my knife and fork, and I picked up that chicken, and I kissed it. (laughs) So I have an uncle, uh, Katabu, really cool dude, um, who I witnessed call on Gregory-style humor and wit during intense encounters. It was this that I drew on in my time of spiritual testing. So the way I decided to do an incentive reversal in this situation was to methodically walk her through the process of mixing paint. The first thing I did was to resolve myself to ignore her shirt no matter what and engage her like any other customer. In my mind, I just made it green. And I said, so you said you want me to get this paint as dark as possible, right? Yes, I want it black, black. Black is tar black. Well, to do that, I'm going to have to take this creamy, deep base and pour some of it out and add a whole lot of black pigment. Once I put in enough black pigment, you'll never know that there was ever any light color. That's what you want, right? I could tell she didn't know how to answer the question, but she just conceded. A considerable number of squirts of black pigment went into the light-colored mix, and after a few minutes of shaking in the mixer, she had the black paint she wanted. And you also said you want the brightest white that I can create, right? Yes, I want bright, bright white. Do you want me to do what contractors do to make the white base have a really bright effect? She was clearly confused that it seemed like I was helping her despite what was written on her shirt. Yes, do whatever uh, they do to make it as bright white as possible. Well, what they do is they take the white base, and I said this very deliberately, is drop just two drops of black in it. One, two. Now, it isn't pure white, but you can't really tell. 
It just gives it a brightening effect and it tricks your eyes. With that, I mixed the second can and then handed it to her. She just stood there confused for a moment and then she just walked off. Her friend, however, remained just for a little while before saying with tears in her eyes, I'm sorry, she's stupid. To which I replied, you don't have to apologize to me. She's not my friend, she's yours. I feel sorry for you. <laughs> now, I wish I could say that responding to that woman that way meant that this experience didn't have an effect on me, but to say that would be inauthentic. It left a mark, but what came after that left a wound. After the woman left, I could feel the anger and frustration I held at bay rushing in. Not wanting to lose my composure at work, I called for my manager to ask if I could take my break early. When she asked why, I told her about the woman and her shirt. And I was trying to, you know, hold back a little bit. But it turned out that she had seen the woman come in and didn't understand why seeing her shirt required me taking my break early. I tried to explain to her, but her response showed me that the, the fruitlessness of that effort. She just said, you ain't a nigger, are you? What she probably meant by that is a whole other story that I'm not going to get into. But needless to say, I didn't get my break early. The rest of the day wasn't awesome either. Ending with my girlfriend at the time and every other uh, black person who had heard the experience expressing their anger with the woman to me, sharing their, their feelings about it, and then their disappointment in me for how I handled it. And in a lot of ways, I can't say I, I blame them. My instincts were probably more aligned with how they felt I should have responded than with what actually transpired. And were it not for Christ and a desire to respect Dr. King's legacy and respond in a way that demonstrated to that woman what I believed Dr. King really stood for, perhaps I would have responded differently because the temptation was definitely there. But then maybe I wouldn't be here today talking to you guys. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this tension that exists in this world to this day? What do we do with these wounds? How do we share across it? As some of you know, recently our church uh, partnered with the Blind Cafe and we did an experiment called Dismantling Racism in the Dark. And some of you attended the pilots. And in it, the participants were led into total darkness by our blind ambassadors. Someone would put their hand on the ambassador's shoulder and then others would link shoulder by shoulder like a train into the darkness where they would be led to their seats. Once settled, we facilitated a small group and some larger group conversations. Whenever someone shared personal stories or anything like that, we would show support by saying, we hear you and we're with you. And it was really a powerful experience for me and I believe most of the people who uh, participated. And when I was asked what was a major lesson that I learned from the experience, I encapsulated it like this. What was acknowledged by nearly everyone I talked to who participated was how vulnerable they felt going into the darkness. Not being to even see their hands in front of their faces with their eyes wide open created an, a sense that their ability to maintain um, in that space meant connecting with others as quickly as possible. And that's exactly what happened. Out of that awareness, I gathered the following takeaways. The quicker you get the vulnerability, the quicker you get the trust. The quicker you get the trust, the quicker you get to authenticity. The quicker you get to authenticity, the quicker you get to engagement. And the quicker you get to engagement, the quicker we get to creating a world that makes sense for everyone. In her book, Daring Greatly, vulnerability researcher Brene Brown had this to say about vulnerability. Vulnerability is not knowing victory or defeat. It's understanding the necessity of both. It's engaging. It's being all in. Vulnerability is not weakness and the uncertainty and risk 
and emotional exposure we face every day are not optional. Our only choice is a question of engagement. Our willingness to own and engage with our excuse me, vulnerability determines the depth of our courage and the clarity of our purpose. The level to which we protect ourselves from being vulnerable is a measure of our fear and disconnection. Does that make sense? We, a lot of us spend our time trying to convince ourselves that we're not vulnerable when the fact is we all are. And we look at other people, sometimes people that we think we're going to help, and we look at them and we say, oh, that vulnerable person. And we acknowledge their vulnerability, not acknowledging our own, which still keeps us disengaged. What I'm offering is the awareness that it's through engaging our own vulnerability that we can actually engage with others who are also vulnerable. And that's what we learned in darkness. When we couldn't see people's faces, and we, could, we could admit things and have that little bit of anonymity by the same, at the same time be in the context of community and to be able to acknowledge our own vulnerability. There are a lot of times we don't know what's going on and a lot of us are a lot more messed up than we're ready to admit. But the degree to which we try to deny that and protect ourselves, the more we don't want to hear the stories of others who are vulnerable. But the good news, besides the fact that we're all messed up, <laughs> is that we've inherited Christ's perfect vulnerability. On Good Friday, I pose it like this from Paul, not my words. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of our creator, so we too might walk in newness of life. For we, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self, which would have been the self that may have gone off on that lady, was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin or error or confusion. For whoever has died is free from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Christ. When Martin Luther King got up on that pulpit or that stage or wherever he went, he carried the death of Christ within him so that he could speak life into a dying world. I, and many of us, as benefactors of this inheritance, carry not only the death of Christ within us, but we carry the death of everyone who has ever stood up and said the truth, who got vulnerable, stood up and spoke truth to power. We carried their deaths with us so that we can speak life into a dying world. And if you don't think this world is dying, turn on the news. But we can do something about it. But not by hiding and protecting ourselves from our harm. Not from thinking that healing means you don't have any pain or any suffering. Didn't we see the scriptures? What did it show us? So many of us think that healing means I don't feel any pain anymore. Everything I went through, I forgot about it. It's gone. But when Jesus showed up to the disciples, he didn't say, Ooh, look at me. I'm stuck. I can do everything. No. <laughs> he said... Touch my wounds. Stick your hand in my side. I'm still jacked up. <laughs> but I'm here by love. I'm here to tell you that if I went through this and I came back from this, whatever you went through, whatever you're going through, you can come back from it too. We all carry that death in us so that we can have that life in us. Let's say amen to that. Amen. 
So when we encounter this world, my invitation to you today is to, no offense to Thomas, but let's, let's not be like that dude. Because the way Thomas went was, he, he knew, he said, I follow you, Jesus. I think you're the Christ. I, I know you're the man. You can do all these things. I've seen you do these things. But then when his friends told him, he said, I won't believe unless I see your wounds and your scars and your bruises. I need to see proof. And every day we have people, many Christs that are among us. And we say to them, they say, our neighborhoods are suffering right now. And we say, let me see your wounds. There's abuse happening. I won't believe it till I stick my fingers in the hole. We need reform. Well, I'm not going to see it until I see the bodies. What is that? We're carrying a lot of deaths in our bodies. But we're also carrying true life. And if people won't stand up and show their wounds, then it's up to us to be an example. It's up to us to say, yep, I've been knocked down, but not knocked out. I've been bruised. I've even been dead. But I'm up. Because it's when we share in this mutual vulnerability that we can encourage one another. And even the people who say that we're out, we got to keep drawing that circle wide. Anytime I lead a, a group like that with discrimination, things like that, I always start with the Edwin Markin poem. It says that he drew a circle and drew me out, a thing to challenge, a thing to flout. But love and us had the wit to win. We drew a bigger circle and we drew them in. Let's draw bigger circles so that we can invite in a world that makes sense. A world where people like Jesus don't have to die. A world where Martin Luther King Jr.'s don't have to die. Medgar Evers don't have to die. The 17 kids in Parkland don't have to die. That's the world that we can create. That's the world that's inside of us. If we can get to that place, then we can speed up the day. Martin Luther King said that in his I Have a Dream speech. That if we open up, if we let freedom ring, that we can speed up that day. His words were this. He said, and when this happens, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, every state and every city, every church, I added that, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children Black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, black women and white women, gay and straight, all the other categories, all the yes, the either ors, when all the either ors can hold hands, can join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God almighty, we're free at last. We can speed up that day. But it's going to take opening up. It's going to take not protecting your heart no matter how much you want to. It's going to take.